Welcome to the Great Loop Radio Podcast, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, or dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. I'm Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. And today, with hurricane season just having started, we are going to cover some of the details on what you can do to prepare your boat for hurricane season. Um, with me today will be John Fitzgerald. He is the president and CEO of Saunders Yacht Works, and he'll be sharing a lot of the details on what you can do, um, what you should look for your yard or marina to do, and what you can do as an individual boat owner. So before we jump into the conversation with John, I do want to take a moment to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Curtis Stokes & Associates, Great Loop Yacht Sales, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, Skipper Bob Publications, and Waterway Guide Media. As always, we encourage our listeners and viewers to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. And with that out of the way, I'd like to more officially welcome John Fitzgerald, uh, CEO and President of Saunders Yacht Works. John, thanks for joining me today. Glad well, to be here. Good morning. Good morning, and thanks for your very long-term sponsorship of AGLCA. I think Saunders is one of the businesses that was a sponsor before I even became involved, so we thank you for that really long-term support. Um, why don't we start, just uh, tell us a little bit about your background and about Saunders Yacht Works. Sure, well, we are uh, delighted to be a sponsor of AGLCA and a great relationship over the years. Our location is ideal to help the, the loopers as they make their way uh, through. We are a full service uh, yacht yard. We have two locations in Orange Beach and Gulf Shores. Uh, personally been involved with the company since 1999. Uh, represent the third generation of a family business that was started uh, by my wife's grandfather, uh, originally in Mobile as a commercial engine service and rebuild company and in 2000 from 2007 we fully dedicated ourselves to uh, recreational vessels uh, we've been we've added the component of the boatyard uh, to the mechanical service uh, earlier in about 1998 uh, before i came on board but uh, in 2007 the commercial uh, We've been part of our business sold, and so we were fully dedicated to uh, the recreational vessels that we service through the boat yards in Orange Beach and Gulf Shores. So um, our location in Gulf Shores has a 150-ton lift, and our location in Orange Beach has a 60-ton lift, and uh, we're, we're very pleased to uh, be honored with the business of a lot of people making the great loop, and, uh, and like I said, we enjoy the relationship with, uh, with you guys. Yeah, and we um, all loopers are going to pass by these locations, and um, you can see one of them right as you're passing by on the loop. I um, know lots of loopers who had some work done there. It's, it's a great place to stop as you're coming off the river system and any anything you need done before you take on that gulf crossing. So um, definitely check out Saunders on your way through. But today we really want to talk about hurricane season because it's here, <laughs> like it or not. Um, hurricane season, for those of you who don't typically um, spend time along the coast is June 1st through November 30th, so six months of the year that those of us on the coast have to be worrying about this. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, the peak of it is a few months away, but now is really the time to start thinking about how you'll handle this if you do find yourself and your boat in the eye of a storm. And there's actually something brewing out there in the Gulf already uh, here as we sit here, uh, um, <laughs> which is, you know, a little daunting to think about. Um, so start off, let's, you know, tell us um, what should a marina or a yard be doing when is a, a storm is approaching to best, you know, I, I guess we maybe we should start by saying that, you know, we have no control over these storms right. and they tend to change, you know, at the last minute. And one of the reasons someone, um, some of our listeners asked me for this topic is because of the devastation that happened in Fort Myers last hurricane season. Um, you know, it seems like the Gulf has been ground zero for so many of these devastating storms over the past years. So, you know, we should start by saying probably there's nothing that you can 100% do to protect your boat or in your case, your business. But, you know, for a looper who perhaps is coming through, um, what should they look for in a marina or yard? You know, what should the marina be doing as a storm is approaching to prepare the facility and any boats that might be there? Well, it's certainly a plan. They start with the fact that any marina that uh, 
uh, Looper interacts with should have a plan and should be able to explain what they're going to do in preparation for a storm. Our preparation really starts at the beginning of hurricane season. So we go into the season with an idea that we will have to execute our, our fall or preparation plan anytime uh, through this time period. It just, it just means a little extra cleanup and a little bit of a uh, sense of the space we would need. So we have an agreement with 60 boats ahead of the storm season that we will haul them. So I guess the first piece of advice that I have is the safest place for your boat in a storm is out of the water, uh, which does create a lot of challenges, especially if you're, you know, in a, in a loop situation where you, you, know, you don't have that, uh, you know, that relationship with a yard where you're in the neighborhood, where you're a, a, a regular, um, like all, all the boats on our plan are boats that are regularly home ported in Orange Beach or Pensacola or Mobile, somewhere close by. So when you're transient, it creates some special challenges. So I guess the first thing is most of the yards or marinas that you're going to be approaching are going to have a plan and you need to ask them what's, you know, when you're when you're docking during hurricane season, what's the plan if a storm comes up? It's an uncomfortable situation, and it's better to ask it when it's sunny out and no, there's no pressure. You can mm -hmm. then know what you have to do, what the marina is going to do. You don't want to be surprised by, hey, we have a, a order to evacuate, or we're going to haul this many boats, but not yours. Uh, you have got to kind of think ahead at what you'll do in those situations. Um, for example, a yard like ours, we have a long-term storage yard. If you want to kind of take all the doubt about uh, hurricane season out in the in the peak months, let's say September and October, you could haul ahead of time, get over to long-term storage, and use that time for your break from the loop. It's mm -hmm. just we we have customers that do that, and then they don't ever have to worry. What am I going to do if a storm comes up because the boat's already up? But that's pretty rare. Most people tend to uh, you know, continue their loop and then react as needed. You just have to kind of know what your reaction is gonna be. Uh, unfortunately, what we learned in Fort Myers, you know, the, the, you're at the highest risk in the water because of number one, the water changes dramatically. Uh, and number two, the other boats, you know, the other debris, the other uh, issues that can come up with, with your boat sitting there tied up. So. Um, I guess that's a start. It's kind of uh, know the plan of the place where you're going and then have your own plan in mind. Yeah, and that that's, you know, certainly a great place to start. And, and I love that you suggested doing that now while it's bright and sunny out and not waiting till you're in the eye of a storm. Um, you know, a lot of loopers, um, one of the reasons, although it's not the primary reason, but one of the reasons the loop is typically done counterclockwise is because it puts you off of the the coastline and into the inland rivers in those highly active months of hurricane mm -hmm. season um but then of course we have some who go counterclock or i'm sorry who go clockwise um and then we also have lots of loopers who you know fall in love with the south the gulf coast is super popular for loopers and and finish the loop and end up staying in the gulf coast year round so you know, that's where some of the concern comes from. And um, in recent years, we've seen a lot more long-term slip contracts for long-term dockage, um, where people are keeping their boat in the water. Um, it, you know, it's perhaps after their loop or even before their loop, and the boat is based in Florida or Alabama, um, but they're not there all of the time. Right. So some marinas, and, and you're the expert here, not me, but my understanding is that some marinas do require the boats to be removed from the marina when there is an impending storm. Um, right. and, and tell us a little bit more about why that is and how an absentee owner can deal with that when that, the, the cone of uncertainty that all of us who live near the coast just love that, um, mm -hmm. you know, what do you do when the storm kind of changes at the last minute, which is really what, um, happened in Fort Myers. You know, that storm was predicted to direct impact on Tampa. And then at the last minute, you know, kind of pointed itself south and, and hit Fort Myers instead. So what do you do if you're not there um, 
and you see that a storm is brewing and it could potentially impact your boat? So uh, I'll start with the question about the rationalization for the marina for getting boats out. Mm -hmm. the, the most exposed marinas, the ones that are closest to a pass or the closest to the coast, typically do have a evacuation order. They're basically looking out for the long-term value of the marina because mm -hmm. boats in the marina that are beaten around by a storm beat up the docks, they beat up the facility, and of course the boats get damaged also, I'm not trying to be insensitive to, to the boat owners, but for the marina operator, the more stuff you have tied up in the water, the more potential damage that comes from that. So there's a long history of marinas that leave boats in the water that then get devastated and are rebuilding docks and other uh, parts of the marina that they may not have been otherwise if they didn't have the boats tied up. So, you know, they have insurance policies too. And their insurance policies may say, hey, if you have this storm, you've got to get the boats out of the marina in order for us to insure you. Um, so I guess the, the first thing is the closer your docks to the Gulf, uh, the more likely you are to be uh, put in that situation. Um, and it's typically in your contract when you sign it. If there's going to be an evacuation order for a storm, you want to look for that. I know nobody likes to read fine print. Most of us do these things online and we get agree quickly, but it's probably in there somewhere if that's part of their hurricane planning. Uh, so that's why um, the issue of what to do as an absentee owner is you got to have a plan. I hate to say it, but the, the reality, if you're going to leave your boat in the water in hurricane season for a period of time, either a contract with a local captain or somebody uh, that can help you with the boat. Um, we have a lot of like if you're getting ready for a storm, there's a lot of activity uh, on the water. And there are a lot of people that could help. And there's a lot of competent people that can help. So if you make that plan ahead of time, then that competent person can step in and move your boat for you. Um, there's a little bit of guesswork involved, as you say, Kim. I mean, you have last minute situations that come up with storms, but if you have somebody who's available to do that for you and you can kind of sit down with them and say, hey, here's here's a couple of options to move the boat to. We have uh, inland marinas that don't operate at full capacity during the year that have slips available for people that contract with them during, uh, during hurricane season. Typically, like where we are on the intercoastal, we have uh, most of the marinas that are uh, in, in the intercoastal do not evacuate because even, you know, they have uh, floating docks and typically the, you know, they can weather those storms pretty well because they're not taking the brunt of the surge. The water is way more devastating than the wind uh, for marine operators and any, any coastal property. So you tend to find places where you have some protection from the surge. We have uh, locations where people go up river and raft up and there's little hurricane holes. I mean, there's all kinds of, of local strategies. So if you're going to have your boat in a marina that is going to require evacuation. And if you don't actually want to read the fine print, you need to ask, hey, are you going to require me to evacuate if a storm comes? And if that answer is yes, then you got to have a plan. I, I can't emphasize that enough. You don't I think I think a lot of I don't I don't know everything that happened in Fort Myers, but it hadn't been hit in a long time and people get lulled into a false sense of security. And you don't if you don't make that kind of a of a preparation plan, you know, facilities and boats got got caught in that situation for sure, then you end up with um that kind of devastation. I mean, good or bad, you know, Orange Beach Gulf Shores, every probably five years we've been hit with a big storm for the last 20 years so we're pretty uh ready you know we have a plan and uh and we execute them and our and our voters typically do as well um, it's just you, you know loopers who are not used to this this kind of a preparation this kind of planning need to think about it 
And, and also what you said about the timing of your trip here is a, is a really good point. I mean, some boats even have insurance policies that don't um, allow them to come south until a certain time of year, um, which is smart, even though it's sometimes inconvenient. Uh, it's pretty smart to be prepared for that. So part of the plan, you need to also know what your insurance policy says, because that's a big um, a big part of, of this planning, and it's now a big part of boat ownership. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the insurance, both both from the marina's perspective, but also from the boat owner's perspective, because insurance is driving so much of this. There have been so many just enormous claims from these storms over the past years um, that insurance is the most challenging part right now of buying a boat if you are not a previous boat, boat owner. Um, and it's just driving so much of these these regulations. And it's it's all designed to try and to protect the boat um, and the marina. Um, at some point, you know, the storm's going to do what the storm's going to do. And I saw so much kind of armchair quarterbacking after what happened in Fort Myers, um, because, of course, you're not far from the protected waters of the Okeechobee. Um, and the storm just changed path. And, you know, I, I kind of broke my heart to see the armchair quarterbacking because I do not know several looper boats were lost in that storm. And I don't know uh, a single looper who would sit back and say, yep, yeah, I'm just going to let the storm take my boat and not try to do anything about it. Right. Um, and, you know, and I know several personally who did every possible thing they could when the storm changed path and there just wasn't the time. Um, right. So preparation is key. And I love also what John said, you know, if you're an absentee owner, having an arrangement with a local captain is a great idea. Um, but you need to arrange that well in advance, because once the storm hits, panic also sets in. Right. Um, and that's, you know, that makes everything just that much more challenging. So um, let's take a quick break and play a message from one of our sponsors. When we come back, I want to focus a little bit about, you know, what you can do if moving the boat completely out of the storm's path is not possible, because even on the hard damage can happen. So ideally, right. the boat's nowhere near the hurricane. Um, but if you have to keep it, you know, somewhere close by, what are the options? So we'll jump into that when we come back. We'll be back in a moment. Curtis Stokes & Associates is a yacht brokerage company that specializes in great loop capable boats. Curtis Stokes is a supporter of AGLCA at the Admiral level. If you're looking to buy or sell a great loop veteran from a trusted and knowledgeable broker, visit the company on the web at curtisstokes.net. Email curtisstokes at curtisstokes.net or call 954 Six eight four zero two one eight. Pebble Isle Marina is the perfect stop for AGLCA members to enjoy docktails, conveniently located in a sheltered harbor on the Tennessee River at mile marker 96. The marina's 600 plus feet of transient dockage offers slips convenient to all amenities and can accommodate boats of all styles and sizes up to 100 feet in length. Our fuel dock offers ethanol free gas and high speed diesel pumps with a ship store for supplies. Our floating seasonal restaurant offers beautiful views of Kentucky Lake from the patio. Check out the Pebble Isle website for details of special offers for AGLCA members. We're back on the Great Loop Radio podcast. My guest today is John Fitzgerald. He is the president and CEO of Saunders Yacht Works, which is a long-term AGLCA sponsor and a place where lots of loopers have work done to their boats. Um, we're talking about what we can do to protect as best as is possible during hurricane season, which we know completely protecting from hurricanes is not possible unless you're in the Great Lakes or inland waters somewhere. Um, but John, let's talk about, you know, you mentioned you can contract with um, a yard to store the boat, you know, haul the boat in advance of a hurricane. That's a very typical scenario in my home port of Charleston. Um, you know, some folks hesitate to pay that it's it's almost a form of an insurance policy you pay a, a few thousand dollar fee for the plan that will haul you out if a storm is coming and of course the yards only have room for so many boats and only have time to haul so many boats um, is that kind of a common arrangement though um, where the, the type of plan you mentioned at Saunders and that we have frequently in Charleston yes actually it's become more and more popular in the, in the industry now they're kind of reserve. You pay to reserve a spot, and I I don't have insurance for a boat, but I have heard that then even if there are some discounts available if you have a haul out plan. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and I, we're going to talk a little bit in a minute about what insurance companies might want to see in a plan because they will want a storm plan. Um, but, you know, hauling out is certainly the best option, but not 100% foolproof because some boats on stored on the hard can be damaged as well in a severe storm. Um, if, you know, and, and it's always, it's, it's kind of... Um, People don't want to haul out too early because what if the, you know, uh, it, 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 everything comes down to money, right? So if you spend the money to haul out too early and then the storm changes course, you just wasted that. Or if you do this plan and a storm never comes, you've paid for that service. So everybody's got to balance their own, you know, financial picture with their risk tolerance. Um, right. You know, the more you're willing to spend and possibly have spent it without having really in the end having needed it, the safer you're going to end up being from the storm. And it's unfortunate, but that's just kind of the bottom line. But um, as you said, John, uh, pulling it out of the water, getting it hauled, storing it on the hard is really the safest scenario. Um, but if that's not possible and you're forced to leave the the boat in the water, you know, what are, what are kind of some of the suggestions? Can you make preparations and, and leave it in a slip? I know some uh, people who have tried to, um, you know, go to a hurricane hole anchorage um, to ride out a storm. Any thoughts on, you know, it's kind of a wild card, but you know, what might be the best option if you have no choice but to leave the boat in the water? Right, I mean, the, so the, uh, the risk factor, the risk tolerance of the owner is a big part of that plan. I mean, we have people that ride out storms on boats, um, but we, we the Hurricane Sally was our last big storm with 130 mile an hour winds and a giant surge, probably about uh, eight feet. And we have people in marinas on boats <laughs> through that storm. They, get, they, they're down there, they adjust their lines, they figure that they want to be there if something goes wrong. Um, and so as the water comes up, they're they're retying and and making sure that the boat is as safe as it can be. Um, so there is that choice. Uh, it would not be mine, um, but that uh, does happen. Uh, people will move the boat uh, inland. Inland is always safer than coastal. So because you you get protection from the surge. Now, some of these hurricane holes, you do have to have the trust in humanity to wrapped up against people and believe that they're also going to be uh, watching out for your best interest or, or for their own best interest that should coincide with yours, because uh, most of that is goodwill among boat owners, and certainly you're exposed to goodwill among boat owners, I would think, a lot on the, mm -hmm. on the Great Loop. Um, and then... Um, you know, the, the marinas that will allow you to stay in uh, will typically have some guidance for you. Like when we haul out, for instance, you know, we want to see uh, customers that then will get all of the anything that will blow. So, you know, typically curtains come down, typically, you know, antennas or anything that's removable. If you have a dinghy, we, we try to secure them under the boat, not on the boat. Um, there's all kinds of other preparation to do, as you say, to, to try to minimize any uh, you know, potential damage. But it's a lot of those choices to come down to what's the risk tolerance that the owner has. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, sometimes you get caught in the path, as you, you know, we're talking about Fort Myers, the, the last minute changes or the change in path of these storms is. Uh, it's, 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 it's speechless. Yeah, what no, say. it's what keeps us all up at night if you're along the coast and yes. there's a storm anywhere well, out there um, because you just never know what the eventual um, landfall spot of that is going to be. Right. Um, you know, and we've been talking a lot in this discussion about kind of those catastrophic storms, which are happening, you know, all too frequently. Um, but for every catastrophic storm, there is kind of a handful of tropical storms or category one or two storms that don't have the kind right. of devastation. Um, right. um, and as far as, you know, leaving the boat in the water, um, when there's no evacuation order, it's probably a little bit more common to leave the boat in the water. Right. Um, so, you know, talk a little bit. Uh, I, I think most of those preparations are going to be similar to what you talked about, even when you do the haul outs. Um, but, you know, Things like uh, securing with extra lines, removing any um, eyes and glass or canvas, like any thoughts of, um, 
you know, besides the basic common sense of remove things that be, can become projectiles um, right. or are going to do more damage, um, you know, what do you recommend to, to boat owners to do to prepare for kind of the more minor storm that is, is still going to have an impact, but not that catastrophic impact? Right. So certainly, uh, you know, extra tying, double tying, is, you know, for more security of the boat. Um, all that you just mentioned, I mean, removing any of those loose things that, that could become projectiles, anything that you think could be damaged in a really sustained high wind, um, like like your uh, curtains and your Ivan glass. I just think that the near miss is the best case scenario. We always say that. So mm -hmm. when we are in the cone of uncertainty, and even if we're not in the in the center of it, if we're on the edge, we still do our plan and we talk about it all the time. Like this is going to cost us money and time and it could be wasted, but it's never wasted, quote unquote, wasted. We always, we have to remind ourselves, you just don't know so you want to be prepared for those late changes. And predictions have gotten a lot better, really, uh, a lot better, but they're never foolproof and they all will always come with that caution to be prepared so those times when you prepare and it's a lighter storm it's a lighter impact you just thank the good lord and you put everything back together and you get back to work for us or they get back going for someone on the loop but i do think it's smart to be prepared every time absolutely and and of course as a business owner um that has that kind of impact uh never wasted <laughs> time you're just thankful the storm missed you if, if you did all those preparations and they weren't needed you're it's still a thankful scenario and i think that kind of mentality comes with um, anybody who owns a business or property or even a boat along the coast mm -hmm. if you've been through enough of the storms you know sit through a 20-hour evacuation road in a car and still be thankful that turned out you didn't need to it's okay <laughs> at least you well, know I'm go back put everything back the way it was and continue on one thing that is also a big factor in these decisions is what else do you have to do? You know, because it's great if you can, or not great, but I mean, if you are available to be on your boat through a, a, a storm or a preparation for a storm or um, do all those things, that is um, a fortunate circumstance. So many of our boaters have other concerns, property, people, what everything else. So Sometimes just getting the boat up and out of the water, even if it's for a longer term, even if it's for a, a greater expense, you look at that and say, that is one asset I do not have to worry about now. I can move on to take care of my family, take care of my other property, get everything else safe. So you just have to, as part of that plan, think of everything else. And, and that um, it will also drive some of your decision-making and when, when you're getting ready for something like this. That's a great point because we've been through them in Charleston and, you know, worrying about securing family first, but also, you know, mm -hmm. your dirt home, if you still have one, if you're on a, a looping boat, um, you know, elderly parents and their property and securing that. The boat was always at the bottom of the list, unfortunately. So, wow. yeah, if you can take one factor out of the equation and know yeah. that that one thing is safe and protected, it gives you certainly a, a little bit more peace of mind. So that, that's a great thought, too. Um so we've mentioned kind of throughout this that insurance is really driving a lot of these decisions these days. Um, most yacht insurance policies are going to require you to have a hurricane plan or require you to not be in, you know, below a right. certain place, um, typically from June 1st through November 1st. Um, right. You know, for somebody who's been a lake boater or hasn't been a boater and they're, you know, working on getting their insurance policy and they're hearing they need a hurricane plan, that can kind of be a daunting task if you've never really had to deal with hurricanes before. So just kind of the basics. Um, and we've talked about a lot of them, but, you know, what are insurance companies looking for in a plan that they're going to be OK with? I don't. Uh, no, if all of that because of you know I, I, I advise customers to to push back a little bit on that mm -hmm. uh, because some people will call me and say I have to have a haul out plan and that's well you have to have a haul out plan you have to have a hurricane plan which well I don't know but I was you know I was advised I, I need a plan I said well sometimes the plan can be like you say I'm not going to be in a certain area at a certain time that's an effective plan now if you say that you got to live with that. Um, Moving the boat 
and a lot of plans is still an effective plan. Like I will take the evacuate from the, the area or I'll, I'll make sure I can, I can move the boat. Having an inland slip is actually, a, a, you know, something that can go on a hurricane plan. So if your boat, we have a, a bunch of boats in our area on Ono Island or in the marinas by the pass that will come back to Homeport Marina or the Wharf Marina, which are uh, both inland marinas, uh, but they have to prepay for that slip, they have to prepay for that room. So um, we've been getting a lot of pressure from um, insurance policy about tie downs uh, in, the, in the haul out. Now we don't tie boats down. We do tie stands or chain stands together, but we have found it completely effective in the big storms that we've been through uh, to have the boat on blocks. We do use extra stands and we, um, Basically, once the boat is on the blocks and secured there, uh, we made it through every storm as I knock on wood. But I mean, I, I don't I don't see the extra benefit of tie downs. Nobody's shown me a study that says tie downs will protect your boat more. Let's say if your if your insurance company is telling you that you need tie downs, ask them what's what's what am I eliminating? Like, is there a certain point where the tie down becomes more effective if the wind gets to a certain point. I, I, I don't think that exists. So we basically present our history and I tell them, call, you know, have your insurance company call me if they want evidence that this is going to work. We'll look at Hurricane Ivan. They will look at Hurricane Sally. But I think that I wouldn't automatically take the first uh, statement from your insurance broker that this is the absolute. Uh, truth or the absolute plan that you need. Push back a little bit, talk about it. And really what they really want to know is, are you going to take this seriously? So if you're actually exercising that discussion with them about what you're really going to do, you're already moving to the point where they, you know, could see, okay, they, they might be able to accept a plan that's not a whole out plan because they know you're going to, you know, be involved and, and uh, take it seriously. But I've never negotiated that with mm -hmm. insurance company. I've just advised customers, don't take the first thing that they say you absolutely have to do. Tell them what you're willing to do, and what you're able to do. And then I think that there's a little bit of room in that, in those, um, in those discussions. So that's, that's my best advice for dealing with insurance companies. Yeah. And that is great advice. I think we'll hold it there with that last gem that is going to be extremely helpful for people who are kind of navigating this entire problem right now. And um, sure. I'm glad we've done this early in the season because I think the message that pre-planning for this, um, you know, possibly even beyond what you've told your insurance company as part of your hurricane plan, but, you know, line up those experts, line up that um, call out plan, you know, ha have everything ready um because you don't want to be scrambling last minute when a storm is approaching so yeah, john well, fitzgerald yeah go ahead. Up, can we i just say you know the, the idea of the loop as a as a dream trip right mm -hmm. yeah. to protect that some of this may cost you more money than you're comfortable with but remember if, if the boat survives the storm and the quicker you can get back to the water and back to to the movement that's the goal the goal absolutely because uh, if you get damaged, that's going to cost you time. And if this is part of something that you've saved a lot of money or or saved time, set aside time for, the extra time that's required for the repair is always worse than the extra money. So if you can buy time ahead of time, then, then that may be one way to think about it. I'll, I'll yeah. leave you with it. No, that is very well said. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, and we appreciate you sharing all these uh, tidbits with us today on how we can be prepared and, and stay safe as best as we can for um, our boats and, and definitely for ourselves through hurricane season. So John Fitzgerald with Saunders Yacht Works, thanks for being here today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Love, love your, you guys and your organization. Thank you. We, we appreciate your support. And thank you to everyone who's watched or listened today. If you enjoy this podcast and appreciate the content, please consider joining AGLCA. You can go to greatloop.org and you'll see a join now button right there at the top of the page. So thanks for being with us. We'll be back next week with another episode of Great Loop Radio. Until then, safe cruising.